Hi there, I'm David Batsoffen and I host a travel blog called Travel and Things. And at the moment I'm doing a series called In Conversation With, where I get to chat to people in the tourism, travel, wildlife industry. Um, and today I chat to the uh, co-founder and CEO of Wild Earth and the son of the far more famous Shirley Wallington, that's Graham Wallington. Graham, did I, did I do the introduction correctly? <laughs> You said you did, David. Um, and uh, yes, you are quite right. My mother is, uh, uh, Shirley, is uh, quite, 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 a, quite a force to be reckoned with in the gardening world. <laughs> David, thank you for having me here. It's a real honor and a privilege to be able to connect with you during these interesting times. It is. It, there are interesting times. And, you know, the weird thing is, Graham, you almost foresaw this. With, if we go all the way back to the beginnings of Wild Earth, which was Africam. Um, putting cameras at water holes, which was what, 20 years ago, 25 years 22. ago? 22, 22 years ago. Yeah. yeah, August the 17th, 1998. So, so take us back. In fact, I want to go back slightly further, um, Graham, and it's a question that I invariably ask all my guests. Tell me about Graham Wallington in matric. What did he want to do? Wow, well, matric, um, this was... Now, let's just try and put this in, in the context. Um, this was just after the late Jurassic era um, yeah. that I finally went. <laughs> no, <there's, laughs> it was a long time ago, David. Um, you know, I was a very, very, very lucky person in the sense that um, from a very early age, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Okay. Um, and um, and uh, it was already from the age of 14 that I decided that scuba diving, uh, traveling the world and spending the rest of my life at that stage, I thought underwater uh, was going to be what I wanted to do. And so right. as I finished my trick, um, I had already completed all of my scuba diving training. And as I turned 18, I got my scuba diving instructor ticket with um, the National Association of Underwater Instructors, NAWI. Yeah. Um, and, um, and then I, I mean, literally, as soon as I had a holiday, we had our big matric bash down in Plettenberg Bay. And uh, straight after that, I was off to um, the Comores, uh, where I lived for a year on Grand Comore um, and was incredibly privileged to, 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 to dive on some of the most incredible Indian Ocean reefs before they were uh, unfortunately dynamited and then later bleached by the coral bleaching event. Um, and, uh, and also was, was, was privileged to see a coelacanth uh, underwater with my own eyes. Um, wow. I've been caught brought close to the surface, uh, about 30 meters from the surface. I went down with Jean-Louis Giraud, assisted him, and he took the first photograph of a coelacanth um, outside of a submersible. By the way, we are talking about a very long time ago. <laughs> and uh, I was then very lucky to be able to spend the next five years traveling the world and working as a scuba diving instructor. And it was really an important time. Uh, I, I lived in California for a year, Grand Cayman in the Caribbean for a year. Then six months uh, in Cannes, Australia, and then a year in the Solomon Islands to the east of Papua New Guinea. And all this time, I was taking people scuba diving under the ocean and became addicted to one very important thing, David. Mm -hmm. And that was the look on people's faces when they came up to the surface. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and really, that, that desire to share nature, because it has such a transformative effect on people, um, what really has, you know, sort of, I don't know, you know, inspired and motivated and given me direction through the rest of my life. And really what Africam and later Wild Earth is, is really just an extension of that desire to take more and more people into nature in a way that doesn't damage nature, but allows the majority to be able to share it. I mean, if I think back to those Africam days, the cameras frozen um, at water holes and poor giraffes in a in a straddling position for days on end because the camera, <laughs> people on the on, on the the chat lines in the days before whatsapp going what is the matter with the giraffe can't it stand up and stuff like that insects crawling on the cameras you guys have come an inordinately long way i mean i've i've been up to your your operation and it's it's almost as big as those people in auckland park <laughs> but no, better run 
you, you know that as of as of we, we're now broadcasting um, on the SA, on SABC three every single day from three to four o'clock in the afternoon. So the first hour of our sunset safari is now broadcast daily. That's seven days a week yeah. um, on SABC three. That was the segue, you see. That's how I do it. <laughs> but you're an artist, David. I mean, I remember, I remember, let me throw out a memory. I remember when you uh, and Tim Leary uh, and a few other of the, of the old folk from radio uh, came and did African radio. Yep. Um, and we were running 24 hours a day. We were streaming a radio show. You guys were watching the webcams everywhere from Okukuyu in Namibia uh, to all the other cams we had around the world. Uh, you guys were able to control them. You had people calling in. You were chatting with the chatters. Uh, it was a very exciting time, and that was in the year two thousand. Eh? Long yeah. time ago. Well, this is what th this is where this whole conversation started by saying you actually mm. preempted this whole lockdown and what COVID nineteen has done to our planet because now your um, your organization is far more jacked uh, up to do that sort of thing. It is. The, the, it's fun to go out with your vehicles because I've been hunkered down in the back, you know, trying not to get in the cameraman's way. But yeah. the technology has changed. Um, and, and also people, I think people's expectations have changed because of that. Well, I mean, firstly, let me, you know, you, you are right, is that, you know, we've, we've, been, we've been doing this concept of uh, trying to connect people with nature through live broadcasting uh, from nature in as authentic a way as possible and essentially trying to simulate the experience of whether it's being on a safari or whether it's going on a bushwalk or whether it's going scuba diving in the Caribbean. You know, it's always been about trying to create the experience for people that is as authentic and realistic as possible. And, and what happened is, is that, you know, we've had a lot of successes along the way, um, but it was in June of last year that after five years of back-to-back uh, -back contracts with National Geographic, that we were just unable to be able to deliver a live daylight safari uh, into the East Coast United States primetime television. Yeah. And as a consequence, because we were delivering outside of primetime, the ROI uh, was just not there for National mm. Geographic relative to the cost that it takes to produce this. And, and, yeah. and as you've seen, you know, a lot of people don't appreciate just how many people you don't see and just how much is going on behind the scenes to, to make this possible. And it's not cheap. It's not cheap at all. And, um, and so what had happened was, was that last year, you know, we, we, we lost this crucial contract. Uh, and we were adrift. We, we, were, we were adrift in, in, in so many ways. Um, and uh, we needed to kind of reinvent ourselves. And um, we began an exercise of really looking at how we could time shift sightings, put hosts into a studio that were live, that would be able to talk to this, did a bunch of experiments. Um, but David, what we were doing is we were trying to build a television show, an entertaining mm. television show. And then suddenly the pandemic struck and everyone went into lockdown. And suddenly what happened was the realization that what we'd been doing before, because it wasn't television, because it wasn't trying to be something it wasn't, all it was trying to do was give people the opportunity to experience nature as simply and as authentically as possible. Suddenly that became the most valuable thing because yeah. suddenly yeah. now we had no shortage of television but no real opportunities to access nature. And if you look at March to April, we saw a five-fold global increase in our, um, in our audience globally. Mm. Five times, five times increase. And what's even more interesting than that is that <clears throat> our average viewing time on YouTube is 45 minutes. Now, just on YouTube. We also broadcast on Facebook, Periscope, Twitch, television, various places. But I'm, I'm only talking about YouTube now. 45 minute viewing session, which is incredibly long. You know, I think, I don't know what the, what the global average is, but it's well under 10 minutes. Yeah. And, and, and what, was, what was so exciting for us is even though we saw a five-fold increase in, in audience, we still maintained that incredibly long average viewing session. And that's so exciting because that tells us that all these new viewers that were coming in were not just passing through, but mm. they were actually sitting down with us and, and spending considerable amounts of time in enjoying our, our live broadcasts. And then here's another thing that was super interesting, David, is that- But that's not all. If you but order that's not now- all. 
Yeah, if you if you compare March to April, in March, 65% of our audience was coming from the US, not North America, the mm -hmm. United States, 65%, and 5% was South African. But in April, it's a third US and a third South African. We saw a 15-fold increase in our South African audience. Um, and, uh, and, and, and even though the American audience doubled, Mm -hmm. The South African audience increased by 15-fold. And that's also been a very exciting trend. I think that Wild Earth has suddenly become uh, an, an important part of the South African zeitgeist. And so many people I know are watching our shows. They wake up in the morning. First thing they're doing, they're turning on that TV and they're, and they're watching it. And, uh, and we're, we're just super proud and privileged to be able to do this uh, for everyone at this time. But you wonder what's taken them so long, Graham? Why has it taken a pandemic with them stuck at home in order to realize that, hey, we've got a world-class program right here on our doorsteps. And even if they were going to school, if you go out at, a, at six o'clock in the morning for a game drive, they can go out at six with you and then be, you know, join for maybe half the game drive or something. There's no excuse. There really isn't. <laughs> You know, the thing, the thing of it is, is that, um, you know, if, if you compare, I mean, and, and, you know, I mean, I know you've been, you know, you've been following my story for decades. And, but if you compare what happened in the early stages of, of the internet kind of boom back in the late 90s, early 2000s with Africa, it was incredibly easy for us to get uh, global awareness or written, mm. I mean, not global awareness, but, 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 uh, but a high level of global awareness. Um, because there was a real, um, there was a shortage of, 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 of compelling entertainment on the internet. Yeah. Uh, this was before Facebook, before Netflix, before Twitter, before any kind of social media, before YouTube, before any of this sort of a thing. And so it was, it, you know, there, there was just less competition. But now we live in a world today where, where, where the competition for eyeballs and, and attention and engagement is insane it, it's 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 it has in itself reached epidemic proportions <laughs> um, and, uh, and, uh, and and so and so there are there are probably thousands if not millions of amazing things out there that people are just unaware of and it's just not possible you know a small company like wild earth simply can't invest the millions of dollars required to to advertise so that the whole world knows we exist yeah and um how the world is. It's, it's not, if only you had the BBC backing like uh, Sir David Attenborough, who can go out with an 87 strong camera crew with the gear that they've invented in order to produce the, the quality of shows that they do. And I mean, their stuff is cutting edge, cutting edge technology at, on every level. Yeah. But well, I mean, I think, I think it's not just money. I think, I mean, obviously the, the thing about, you know, the question you should ask yourself is, even with the BBC's backing, if, if we hadn't heard of David Attenborough before and, and he was to suddenly pop onto the scene today, there's, I would argue that there's zero chance, even with a large amount of money backing, that we would achieve that same level of, of, of global awareness. Yeah. The world has just changed so much that, that you know, those things aren't going to happen again as easily. No, and there are too many people chasing snakes and leaping on alligators and running after camels in the Australian desert and those type of things. And, and um, Sir David has gotten to a point in his life that he just wants to do voiceovers and maybe appear in a nice part of, of the episode where he doesn't have to crawl into guano-filled caves or something like that anymore. At 93 or 94, he doesn't, he doesn't need to anymore. I would agree. <laughs> I'm sure he would too. I, I, I can't see David Attenborough, you know, chasing a camel in the desert right now. And uh, no. if he did, I'm sure the whole world would watch that. <laughs> <laughs> that would get that would get lots of views on. That certainly would. <laughs> <laughs> Grab, where does lockdown find you? Just as a matter of interest, I'm trying to see yeah, what's in good. the background of your of your. I take it it's your office. It's my office. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll try and swivel it a little. It, I just don't want it to go flying. It's my no, I see some cleaning here. material on the shelves. Yeah, yeah, bunches <laughs> of junk everywhere. I mean, I've got, I don't know, there's junk oh, everywhere. Okay. You know, it's just, there's my, my children over there. And yeah, we're, we're all, we're all there. There we go. So, so I'm in Johannesburg. 
I, I like I've always that. enjoyed this book. So, so I, I've worked from home for David since before I knew you. Uh, I, although I had an office at Africam, um, I, I've worked at home, I mean, um, as far as I can remember my whole adult life. Mm -hmm. So we have an office in Ulova, which is where the control room is and finance and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously I go in there from time to time, but, um, but I, I work from home. Okay. So take me through a typical day of, of Wild Earth. Well, it, you know, we start at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, no, you we'll, don't. You start before then. You go out at six o'clock. Those poor well, buggers yeah, are actually, up at four. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think for me to take you through a typical day of Wild Earth is, is actually quite complex because, because you know, um, there's so many of us, but, but, you know, we put out a two, three hour broadcast at the moment. There's mm -hmm. a lot more coming, but for now, that's what we're doing. Um, and, um, and those are Africans and they come from a variety of locations. So we have... We have uh, two feeds coming out of Juma. We have a feed coming out of and beyond Zingala Private Game Reserve to the west of Kruger. We have a feed coming out of Eco Training's Pride Lands, which is also to the west of Kruger, part of Baluli. We have another feed coming out of Tswalu in the Kalahari. Um, and, uh, and also another feed coming out of and beyond's uh, Pinda in KwaZulu Natal. We have, as I think you know, we also have a camp in the Masai Mara with capacity mm -hmm. for three feeds from three vehicles. But at the moment, that is not been, uh, we have not been broadcasting for a year. Or it's been a real uh, political challenge and a real challenge for us to deal with the authorities there. Um, uh, and sadly, I think that uh, as hard as we've tried to bring that back on stream, it's just economically unviable. And, right. and I think we've pretty much reached the stage now where we have to, where we have to pull out of the Mara permanently. Mm -hmm. um, but we are also discussing so many you know with the with with the tourism problem that we've encountered here there is there is just so many people that i'm talking to uh with some super exciting projects throughout africa and the world right um and um but anyway in a typical day would be the guides and camera operators in these various locations would wake up um probably about an hour beforehand i would imagine but half an hour before is what we call bums in seats time right um and uh and as you'll remember uh the teams are all bums in seats half an hour before and they begin their pre-flight checks um, I'm, and so i'm glad you brought that up because that was probably the most exciting well not the most but it was exciting for me to experience because i've been on hundreds of game drives but i've never heard them do as you call them pre-flight checks and no. and it's most interesting because i've been on vehicles where they should have done pre-flight checks and they would have realized that they didn't have a high lip jack and they didn't have a tire to change when they got a flat but that was at a different camp and different people um, so those pre fight checks are fun to listen in on. They are, they are. And just for those of you that uh, are listening, is, is that what happens is the director in the control room uh, has, uh, has a radio communications to all of our crews uh, into their ears, uh, wherever they are. Um, that's both camera operators and guides. On, so you, you'll obviously have seen it when you watch the show. You'll see the little thing coming from the, the guide's uh, ear. Um, but the camera operator also does have that comms. And the director then uh, works through with everybody on their pre-flight checks um, uh, through everything from the technical equipment, their own prep pre preparation. Right now, it's also people's temperature um, and also how they're feeling because, of course, we're, we're monitoring and screening on a daily basis all of our crew uh, with, with, with COVID-19. Um, and, and crucially, we then also do sound checks. Uh, so sometimes people often write in and say, well, why hold on. Dylan in Swalu is way too loud and it's supposed <laughs> to have been resolved in the pre-flight checks where we get everyone's levels correct. Uh, we also do delay checks. So what will be happen is the director will ask the guy to clap um, and, uh, and then she will, and as I think you also know, David, all of our directors are she's. Um, so it's a, and, and uh, so she will then, whoever's directing will then do a delay test because the, um, we can have up to four, five, six seconds uh, delay between the vehicle and the control room. And it's a real challenge because the director has to uh, almost um, predict the future in terms of being able to know when to cut and to get that cut smooth so that it, it feels you know, co cohesive to the viewer. Mm -hmm. um, so we do those checks. Um, also, at that point is um, where we prepare all of our distributions for the endpoints. So what, what that means is, is that um, in addition to Wild Earth's own YouTube, Facebook, 
uh, Periscope and Twitch accounts. We also broadcast to all of our partner um, uh, endpoints on YouTube, Facebook, uh, etc., as well as television clients like SABC, sometimes Nat Geo. Recently, we were broadcasting with the BBC into China, um, which was very exciting on the Tencent platform in China. Um, and those all need to be coordinated um, and prepared so that we know where we're going, so that as the broadcast begins, all the correct endpoints are receiving the signals. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of work that takes yeah. place before the first, the first you know, uh, frames appear on the screen. And at what particular point do you send out emails to the animals going, listen, we'll be there in 20 minutes. Wait for the kill until we get there. Don't yeah, kill so before you see, that's we been arrive. A big problem. You, we, we have a real problem with the animals, David. You know, I've spent years on this problem. For one thing, they don't check their email often enough. This is a right. major problem. You know, it's, it's you know, it, just getting the, the animals to do that. And, and the other problem we find is that certain an, animals, particularly the ungulates, struggle to type, you know, and, um, and, and the keyboards are just designed for primates, not ungulates. And, um, <laughs> it's that, and, it's, it's it's that whole problem. cloven hoof thing. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but th this is, and I'm sure that you get people who ask you that question. You 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 sent out somebody on a drive, um, whoever is is out there for the, that particular one, be it James or be it Brent, whatever, or any of the the, the ladies, because you have some incredibly incredibly not knowledgeable guides on those vehicles. Um, I have learned so much from all of them in the years that I've interacted with them. Um, but I'm sure that somewhere along the line, you'll get somebody asking on, on that um, feed, uh, sort of guest feed, why are there no animals? Why are we, He's been driving for 20 minutes. We haven't seen anything except one lone baboon sitting on a rock looking at itself. And then so, you, have, you know, David, in, in, back in 2007, uh, when, we, when we began with Wild Earth, uh, on the 27th of April, we started broadcasting Wild Earth uh, in 2007. We only had one vehicle. And, uh, and, and the guides then, like Nick de Jong and Peter Pretorius and others, they, they would go out on a, on a sunrise or on a sunset safari with only one vehicle. That meant we had one unbroken three-hour shot. And during that time, yes, it, was, it meant that when you drive from sighting to sighting, if it took 20 minutes, if it took half an hour, uh, that's what you had. Um, and, uh, and, and that was definitely the case. Today, we are in such a privileged position with so many partners and such an, uh, you know, the, the, the directors have six to eight contribution feeds coming in from four or five locations. Um, and this makes, means we're spoiled for choice. Um, and, uh, and we're able now, pretty much all the time, to, to cut from sighting to sighting to sighting. Mm. Um, and, um, and to create that illusion, because that's all it is, is an illusion <laughs> that, um, that, uh, that, that, that there, you know, we could just go from animal to animal to animal. Yeah. So it really has become, in many respects, a numbers game, is that um, the, 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 the long term, you know, for so many years, I tried to, to, to sell, to, to convince broadcasters to take our live safaris onto their TV air. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it took me until 2013, uh, and I started this in 1998, so it took 15 years. Well, it's not true, actually. I did do 27 episodes to the BBC in 2001. But it took a very, very long time to get a, um, uh, the broadcasters to really see the potential here. And the main problem they had, other than the time zone problem, was the fact that, well, what's going to happen if we don't have any animals to see? And the only way we could combat that was just having, a, it's a numbers game, by having so many vehicles or walks or boats or whatever in as many different epic wildlife locations is the, is the secret to being able to be sure you've got something. And you know, viewers don't need to see a, a, a kill. In fact, our, our viewers don't like kills. They, yeah. they don't like them. Uh, you know, what they want is they want to be able to connect with the same animals over and over again and they want, it, they want insights into the opportunities and challenges that those individual animals have. Yeah. Because the difference, and I, I say this often, so you know, if any of your viewers have heard this before, I apologize, but the difference between physical tourism and virtual tourism 
is that when a physical guest comes on safari, they might come for three or four days. And in that time, they want to see the big five. And when they see a leopard, they see a, a representative of the leopard species. They see a leopard. And yeah. they learn some facts about leopards. And they tick that box mentally and say, I've seen a leopard in the wild. But our viewers, virtual tourism viewers, they come back every single day, day in after yeah. day and day and day. They don't see a leopard. They see a specific leopard that they get to know. And what happens is, is that when our viewers see an individual being, they empathize with that animal. And that, David, is what we are. We are an engine for empathy which is all about giving people an opportunity to connect with nature by following the unfolding lives mm. of these individual characters. Um, and, uh, and I really do think that's actually at the heart of what Wild Earth stands for. Yeah, I hear what you're saying because I, I know when, when I followed it and specifically because I got to, uh, I was introduced to certain of the leopards while, while I was at Juma. Uh, and then I think one of them vanished. And the, the yeah. viewers were distraught they really and truly were. And then Karula. You have to, You're talking and then about you, Karula, yeah. Yeah. And then you have to explain that this is, this is what happens, you know. Um, they wander off, they get killed, they die for whatever reason. And it's just mm. the way that nature works. And as you say, people become empathetic too. And they, I think they get to understand what wildlife is all about. It's not just about rocketing off on a vehicle, ticking off. Uh, because they, they seem to be moving away from Big Five and now calling it either dangerous game or iconic species. Um, and looking for other things, small stuff, dung beetles, um, you stories. know, stories. stories. That's, that's what they want because everything else you stories. can see, you, you, can, you can see or you can experience on a variety of different platforms. But in your case, tell them a story. That's what they want. You know, Albert the art fuck, you've seen him every day. And then poor old Jessica, the, the hyena comes along and eats Albert. And that's the end of Albert type of thing. And I'm simplifying it Absolutely. now because that's not what you guys do. Um, well, hey, we wouldn't call Albert Albert. Uh, we, we try to avoid those kinds of names. Yeah. We try to look for names that are, that are Rip. more descriptive of the characteristics of the animal. Yes. Um, uh, and, and, and that's really to try to, you know, one of the great challenges that I have is that in, in amongst all the guides, particularly here in South Africa, is this fear of anthropomorphization. Yeah. This belief that if you name the animal, you're anthropomorphizing it. And it's a real challenge for me to, 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 to train the guides that the reason we name the animals is not because we're projecting human characteristics into them. It's only so we can identify them. Yeah. Um, and that we choose names that are in some way uh, descriptive of the individual. So, for example, Karula, the leopard you're talking about that we were also distraught when she, when she, when she was lost to us. Her name means peace. Mm. And when she was a youngster, not when she was older, because that name made no sense when she was older. <laughs> but when she was a youngster, she was a very peaceful cat. Um, and I knew her mom very well, uh, Safari, um, who was a very famous leopard in that area. But, but then Karula's son, Hosanna, who is now arguably even more famous than his mom, means little chief. And, you know, that is, those are the names that we try to give yeah. to people, uh, sorry, to, to the animals. But what we don't want to do is make out that they are people. So we wouldn't yeah. call one Albert. Um, yeah. There was, unfortunately, one leopard that was named Madiba. And we had to explain to everyone, ah, ah, we can't call the leopard Madiba. And so we renamed the leopard Sindile. Um, mm. uh, you know, and... and it's important to, 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 to identify, but not anthropomorphize. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hear what you're saying. And also, uh, I'm sure that, that your uh, guards get excited when they see unusual sightings. Um, Art Park and Pangolin were on the top of my list for 53 years. And I saw both of those, one in November and one three weeks ago. Um, where, did you see the, where did you see the pangolin? In Klaseri. Nice. And I, and I was... Sorry? Was it a good sighting? Sorry, I'm was it a good sighting? I sat with the thing for an hour and a half, Graham. Wow. The, the guide wow. realized, I normally when I go into a reserve, and I'm sure, again, via your various platforms, people say, oh, can't you find, or, you know, I, I've always wanted to see. And Pangolin were, was on my list for 53 years. And Sheesh. 
every time I went to a reserve and they'd say, what would you like to see? And I'll go, pangolin. And you can see the, 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 the field okay. guide just go, and then I'll go, or something die in front of my lens. And they go, that we can try and organize. Pangolin, not so much. And when we got the call about the pangolin, uh, we both, both the, the guide and I thought that the guy calling in had said penguin. Now, understand that at that particular stage, there'd been penguins wandering around Simonstown because of lockdown. There were no people. And we thought maybe one had... And also, it was or... probably cold. It was probably cold in the Clitteri. So it, no, it's not it's, impossible. You know? It's not impossible. <laughs> and, then, and then when we realized it was pangolin, the next thing is always, how close is it? Because I've heard yeah. them called, and by the time you get there, they've waddled off. And she yeah. said, look, it's away. It was probably 40-minute drive. And we didn't sub Ferrari safari over there. When we got there, it was under a bush and all rolled up. And I thought, well, I've waited 53 years. If this is all I'm going to see of it, suck it up and just be grateful, David. And wait. And, then, yeah. and, and wait. And then um, Buffalo were called in. We had um, Americans on the vehicle. They'd never seen Buffalo. Pangolin to them was unimportant. And the field guard said, look, I'll leave the tracker with you and sit here. And I did. And eventually it realized that there was nobody to hurt it. And it stuck its nose out. And as I say, I had an hour and a half of the most unbelievable. I still can't believe it. As I'm telling you wow. the story, I'm going cold. Wow. And the art It's amazing. The you know, the other day we had a pangolin. I think we've had a pangolin in Pinda. I think we've had a pangolin in, in Swali recently. And on one game drive, Mm -hmm. We had two separate art fark sightings on one game drive uh, in Swalu, which was just amazing. I mean, that's ridiculous. And to make things to make things even worse, I get back from the drive. My wife hadn't gone out with us that morning. She's not a morning person, and Pangolin were not was not on her list. I come back, and I think she could see on my face. She went, "You found your Pangolin, didn't you?" And I said, "Yes, I did." They go out two nights later. I didn't because I was working or I had something to do in camp. And they come back and I'm standing there with the drinks pretending to be one of the, the staff members and hoping, I say to them, what, what did you see? And I was waiting for them to say, ah, nothing. Because it had been a bit drizzly and they come back with pangolin. Wow. They'd seen a different pangolin. So if I'd gone out, my wow. first pangolin would have been 53 years and my second would have been 20, 48 hours. And the art fark, we found at four o'clock in the afternoon at a reserve, just walking down the side of the road. We found him That's two days awful. later, the same youngster at 11 o'clock in the morning. Where, where was that? What, what reserve? At Mabula. But quite cold, eh? recently, it, during it was. cold snap. It yeah. was, it was three weeks ago. It was the, the 14th, yeah. and 14th and 16th of June we found him. So yes, it was cold, um, but he was number two. He was number two on my list, who, who then became number one, and now I have nothing on the list at the moment. I'm I'm working hard at trying to find something to put on. I thought uh, Art Wolf and Batty at Fox, and then I had to look through my archives, and I realised I'd seen both of those. I've got both of those, in fact, in the same image from Gramstown. Art Wolf and and Batty at Fox in the same image. In the same image. Gee, that's impressive. That's well, where where did you get that picture? Quandway in the Eastern Cape. Wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's amazing. really amazing, yeah. That's yeah. that's something. <laughs> it's not a great photograph, but they're they're identifiable, that's about all. I, I wouldn't but still, use them again. I mean to get those two in the same photograph is yeah. like, you know, it's yeah. like getting a gorilla and an orca in the same picture, you know. It's like <laughs> How did you do that? <laughs> one of them, one of them wasn't real. <laughs> Listen, you talk about that though, Graham. I got all excited. I was at Pillensburg just before lockdown. And, and I thought I saw an art book because they are there, I believe. Um, and I took photographs and I, I tweeted about it. Get back to the camp. And the, the guy says to me, no, re-look at your image. And it was a brown hyena. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, there's a there's a lot of you know. I, I can I can see that that confusion could occur. I mean, obviously, yeah. an artful is a lot thinner, but the hair, the sort of yeah. the, the, the silhouette is not so different. Yeah. No, it's that's I can see that happening. Yeah. So, do you have um, animals on on a list that you haven't seen or that you've seen very rarely? 
Uh, for me, you know, because of what I've done for my whole life, right. I don't really have a bucket list of what I want to see. I have a bucket list of what I want to share. Um, okay. and, uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's my, you know, you take photographs. I, I, I broadcast live. So for me, the satisfaction comes not from me seeing it, but from me showing it to a whole bunch right. of other people live. And yes, there is one in particular, or two actually, um, two, two animals that are very high on that list for me. Uh, the one is wolves in the wild. Uh, um, okay. So we did, we did for, at the Wolf Center in New York, we, we, we had uh, webcams on, a, on various different wolves in, 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 a, in a breeding, it's not a zoo, it's a breeding project. Mm -hmm. and so we have seen wolves and puppies and, and so on, but it's not the same. I did try um, with a, this kind of a, a hero of mine, Jim Brandenburg, uh, many years ago. I, I can't remember. I think it was 1999 or 2000. Uh, I went up to visit Jim Brandenburg in the Great North Woods, uh, uh, northern Minnesota, up against the border with Canada. And um, we, we wanted to put a, uh, a webcam into a wolf den. Um, and um, and well, it's a long story, but we, we were unsuccessful, essentially, because... We were we, we we need to you need to get that webcam into that wolf den before the wolves den because once mm -hmm. the wolves have denned, if there's any disturbance whatsoever, then they will not den there. If there's you know they are they more than wild dogs, mm -hmm. they are incredibly sensitive to den disturbance, um, and it was just deemed although we'd found the den and we were confident that they were going to den there. The risk was deemed too much that it was too close to the potential den season that if we did put that camera in there there's a chance that she wouldn't den and that could damage obviously you know the, the success of that breeding season yeah. so it was deemed unsuccessful and we ended up putting the camera into a beaver's lodge and it was the okay. very first way it came in a beaver's lodge that had ever been done um, and and so w wolves remain an unfinished sort of project for me. Obviously, we've moved past the webcam era, um, and and so the the story that I'd like to tell now with wolves would be probably in Ellesmere Island with the white wolves on Ellesmere Island, part of Canada. These wolves are very unique in that they um, they they live on a completely uh, uninhabited monster island. Ellesmere is huge. Um, and um, and and it's um, and it's uninhabited, and there's almost nobody that ever goes there. So when people do go and they do get a permit, um, and, and I've known a few people to get permission to do this, um, the wolves have no fear of human beings um, oh. at all. And uh, and so you can you can you can film. They'll come right up to you. There's just no fear at all, uh, which is why it's so crucial that that this place is protected. Yes. Um, but I would I'd love to share I'd love to share that that experience with the world. And then the other animal that is um, I don't know what to say about this animal. It's the orca. Um, <laughs> is that I, I I have an immense amount of respect. I've been very lucky in my life to have on two or three occasions encountered orcas in the wild, uh, including one time in the Solomon Islands, which is counterintuitive because everybody associates orca with, with, with very cold water. Yeah. Um, not always <laughs> the case. Um, and yeah. um, and, and I, I'm just absolutely intrigued at the incredible intelligence and emotional empathy and, uh, well, not that there's any other kind of empathy, but, um, you know, I, I, these animals are, are intriguing. And I have a real sense when around them that, um, you know, we as human beings always have a tendency to see ourselves as the smartest, uh, <laughs> most, m most you know, no. <laughs> most whatever animal. We're not. And I, and I really do think that those orcas are, 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 are a real cut above human beings on so many emotional and, and intellectual yeah. levels. Um, and so those two, wolves and, okay. wolves and orcas, are, are my, are my big, big interests. Funny, funny enough, you should bring up, up uh, the fact about humans and uh, top of the food chain. We're not. Trees are, more, are cleverer than we are. We don't put out tannins if somebody wants to come and eat us. We just stand and scream. Um, we are useless. We can't outrun anything. Even dung beetles, I think, would pass us. But don't kind of trees, trees also struggle to outrun things. Uh, you know, when I last well, checked, not that I'm an expert. This I'll have to check with my mother. This you, is her field of expertise. <laughs> Shirley, answers on a postcard, please. Um, this is why I always joke. I, I always tease uh, people who, who are enamored with trees. 
and they'll show you a tree. And look, trees are, are exciting. If, if the right person is telling you the story, then they can be really, really exciting. Absolutely. But trees don't go anywhere. So if you drive past it and you miss it today and you drive the same road tomorrow, that tree is there tomorrow and for in perpetuity unless somebody cuts it down. It's not like an animal that is there and then gone while you're still talking about it. Trees will hang about. You don't have to rush anything. You can take your time. You can show, you know, bits and bobs. And, and those tree people sometimes get a little bit tetchy when you tease them. Fair enough, mate. I, I mean, I hear you. I mean, I, I think that, I think that it's not that, it's not that we have to decide who is better or worse, whether humans yeah. or, you know, I think the point is, is that, 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 that what we all need to do, and I hope that we do, and I think it's happening through this pandemic, is there's a little bit of humbleness, which uh, I hope uh, we're all taking the time and the courage mm. to experience a little bit of humbleness and to realize that not only do we need to be there for each other, you know, in other words, you know, even if you're a young, healthy, fit, high immune system person, you should still wear that mask and you should yep. still wash your hands and you should still socially distance, not because of yourself, but because of everybody. And that, um, and that we, we are, as individuals, you know, we have no exoskeleton, we've got no claws, or most of us, you know, <laughs> our, our incisors are pretty small, our canines are ridiculously small, you know, we are, our strength lies in our community. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we need to, we need to do that. And then outside of that, we also need to recognize that we as a species cannot exist in a vacuum either. That we, you know, that we are part of something bigger and that we need to be humble enough to see that and respect yeah. that reality. Without, without that insight, without that, I don't see how we move through to the next part of human and, you know, life evolution. I, yeah. I, I, you know, humbleness is the, next, is the next requirement. Where do you see um, Wild Earth going to now, Graham? David, you know what? For me, it's always been very simple. I have one simple, clear vision that has driven everything that we've done from the very beginning, and it won't change. We are on a mission to create a 24-hour-a-day live wildlife television channel where people anywhere in the world can log in at any time of the day or night, that there's no schedule. They don't know exactly where they're going to go. But they're going to move from sighting to sighting to sighting around the world and have an expert provide them with insights into that individual animal's life. And they're going to have the opportunity to send their questions in so that they could be answered. Oh, That's it. And the technology will lead you there as well because things are just going along in leaps and bounds, I should imagine, from your point of view, with drone footage and high-speed connectivity and those sort of things now. You know, everybody tends to think that, um, that, that, that technology is the driver here. Um, and I understand that because, of course, you know, over the last 20 years, we've seen such a technological revolution that we've come to think of the world in those perspectives. So, in other words, we'll, we'll tend to think that Wild Earth is a technological business, but it's not. Um, I, I, we're using the exact same technology that we were using 22 years ago. Wow. Uh, well, no, 20, no. 18 years ago. Okay. Um, but the, but the, what, 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 it, what matters are the people, not just the guides. The guides are obviously, and the camera operators and the directors, obviously. But it's the viewers, and it's the landowners, and it's the reserve managers, and it's the, it's, 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 it's the community of people that, that, that are stakeholders in what we do in all various different ways. That is where the transformation has been happening and will continue to happen. And what's happening is, is a realization that virtual tourism is not a replacement to physical tourism. Virtual tourism is a crucial part of the future because what we've got to be able to do is we've got to be able to scale access to these ecosystems without scaling our impact on those ecosystems. Mm. Another way of saying it is that virtual tourism is an ecosystem service that has the ability to provide the, uh, the service of connecting to nature, to, to all of humanity, without having all of humanity immerse itself in the nature, which would destroy it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that what's happening is it's not about technology, it's about people's understanding 
of nature and each other that is transforming and making what Wild Earth does possible. Sounds great. Graham, if people want to find out more about Wild Earth, where do they go? Um, can they buy merchandise if they want to, to participate, you know, be seen to be wearing their Wild Earth t-shirts? Sure. Um, uh, we, 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 we sell merchandise through Teespring. Uh, you can go to wildearth.tv. Everything is there. So that's wildearth.tv. But also you can just search Wild Earth anywhere and you'll find us. You know, our whole policy from the very beginning, you know, we didn't have a website for the first three years. Mm. Um, and, and that is because we don't believe in trying to bring an audience to us. What we do is we take our content to an audience. So wherever you're used to watching content, you will find Wild Earth. Just look for it. Great stuff. My guest on In Conversation with today has been Graham Wallington. Graham, once again, thanks for joining me. And it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you again. Thank you, David. Always a pleasure. Anytime, mate. And great to see you doing so well and so happy during these times and really enjoying these shows. So thank you very much.